The mud from Lisa's boots fell off in clumps as she stepped onto the porch of her timber frame house. Through the window and the door, she could see all of her things. The faces in the photographs of her friends were happily staring out from their positions on the wall, and the warm lights were inviting. But she still felt the danger within. The humid heat made the night feel full, like she was walking through a bog. Now she thought about it, it felt hotter than hell. Seemed appropriate. Whatever apprehension she felt, she knew she had to step back inside. There was nothing else for it. She set the bloodied shovel against the porch swing, wiped her feet, and stepped over the threshold. The lights blinked to greet her. It had only been two hours ago that she was wrapped up in bed, fighting for sleep against the unseasonable heat. It was already late then, and her frustration was becoming as much an obstacle to rest as the weather. She wished the storm would just come and end this relentless humidity. Later she would wonder if any of the night's horrors would have occurred if she had just been able to drift off. Rufus, her collie, had been the first to notice it. While she tossed and turned, he lay still, listening and watching the door from the foot of her bed, ever the dutiful guardian. Lisa had learned long ago that if you chose to live alone in the middle of nowhere, with nothing but miles of fields all around you, you better find yourself a damned good guard dog. Or rather, if your twin decides to walk out of your life in the heat of yet another of your legendary arguments and die before any reconciliation can be made, then you should find yourself a good guard dog, because there's no coming back from that. When one half of a whole dies, the part left behind remains half. Never complete again. Alone, whether they like it or not. Lisa had tried and failed to make her peace with it over the years. She tried to stop blaming herself for being too stubborn to apologize, or refusing to see Lucy again after she left. Most of all, she tried not to blame herself for starting that argument, and so many others in the past. So many, in fact, that as they were growing up, people referred to Lisa as the evil twin. Which, of course, she hated so much that she would get angry and inevitably would start another argument. Lisa recognized she had a temper and a general disdain for other people, but that's why she had Rufus. She wasn't alone with him around, and she never fought with him. They were enough for each other, the dutiful guardian and the evil twin. The dog now raised his head and watched the door more intensely. Then, without warning, he gave a couple of low, muffled barks. Lisa sat up to see what he was reacting to, but as she rose, she heard it. Something hit Rufus's dog door, hard, and the familiar rat-tat-tat of its swinging gate resounded from downstairs. Something had come into the house. Rufus wasn't a small dog, but his dog door was still not wide enough to allow a person to get through, 
as she found out one drunken afternoon when her cousin had attempted to do so and gotten stuck. As relieved as she was that it wasn't likely to be an intruder, she still didn't relish the thought of a fox rooting through her cupboards and getting into her food. She got out of bed and slid on a pair of olive green khakis, which were uncomfortable due to the heat, but at least if the animal got hostile, it wouldn't be able to get at her bare skin. She then called Rufus to her side and stepped into the hallway, turning on lights as she went, hoping that would be enough to scare it off. Sounds came from the kitchen. Something was shuffling around in there. Rufus's ears were pricked all the way up, and he trotted eagerly by her side. They reached the bottom of the stairs, strolled over to the kitchen, and switched the light on. Lisa gasped. There were droplets of blood all over the floor, leading from the dog door. Whatever it was, it was injured. The blood gave off an unpleasant odour that burned her nostrils. Rufus gave another muffled bark at the cellar door, and when Lisa looked over, she saw it was slightly ajar. She opened a drawer by the back door, in which she kept what Lucy had called the storm torch, and switched it on, knowing that the light down there was broken, and she still hadn't replaced the bulb. Rufus, stay, she said. The dog obeyed, but was clearly disappointed to be left out of the fun. She stepped down into the coolness of the cellar, and wondered if she should just sleep down here once the fox was gone. Here, foxy, she said to the darkened room. The shuffling sound came once more over by the adjacent wall. Lisa shone her torch towards it, and what she saw took her breath away. It was no fox. The creature stood on two legs and was no bigger than a child. Its back was hunched and its small arms clung close to its body. There was no visible neck, so it was hard to determine where its body ended and its head began. Worst of all, it appeared utterly fleshless, as the muscles and sinews were completely exposed and it gave off a smell that was far more pungent than its blood. It turned towards Lisa and she caught a glimpse of the flat, narrow form that must have been its face. If it had eyes, she couldn't see them. It made some sort of noise, an aggressive, guttural utterance, and Lisa cried out in return. She rushed back up the stairs, away from this foul thing, and slammed the door closed before it could follow, making sure to throw the bolt across. Breathless and panting, she stepped back from the door in disgust, as if it were covered in the creature's blood and she was afraid to get it on her. For a moment she stood staring, terrified and unsure of what to do. Rufus gave a small whimper, and she broke her gaze away to check him. He was lying on his side on the floor, breathing quickly. Lisa dropped down next to him, and panic mingled with her fear. She checked him all over to see what could be wrong. The only thing she could see was a trace of blood upon his nose. It hit her. She looked to where some of the blood drops had been on the floor. They were smeared as if they had been wiped. Or licked. No, Lisa cried, clutching at the dog's fur. Why? Why did you do that? 
Whatever it was, the blood was already having an effect on him. His rapid breaths were turning into growls and were coming faster and faster. Froth began to form at the corners of his mouth and his body started to convulse. Rufus's eyes were staring directly ahead and his pupils were pinpoints. Overhead, the lights flickered. The fuse box was in the cellar. The creature must have found it and was playing. Rufus's growls were now something monstrous, as if he were trying to expel his lungs. Without warning, he turned his head and snapped at Lisa. She jumped back, terrified. Rufus got to his feet, teeth bared and jaws slavering. There was no trace of recognition in his eyes. Lisa tried calling his name, but he either couldn't or wouldn't listen to her now. Sensing no other option, she ran out of the kitchen and down the hallway. Rufus was at her heels almost straight away. Lisa felt his jaw clamp around her ankle and she stumbled to the floor. His teeth slipped and snagged the bottom of her trousers, which he proceeded to shake like a rope toy. She crawled, pulling the collie along with her in a desperate scramble to get away. She kicked back at him and hit him square on the nose. It was enough to loosen the dog's grip for just a moment, but that was all she needed. She sprang up to her feet and dashed towards the front door. But just as she had unlocked it and swung it open, the dog leapt up and crashed into her, sending them both tumbling out across the porch and into the yard. Lisa felt the wind leave her body, and she gasped for breath. A shovel she had used for gardening earlier that week fell next to her. She could hear Rufus already returning to his feet, so she seized the opportunity to defend herself and grabbed it. She turned just as Rufus leapt on top of her, and she held him at bay, mere inches from her face, with the handle of the shovel. His lips were drawn right back, and he snapped at her, his hot breath blasting against her skin. Strands of saliva dripped into her face, mingling with her tears. Lisa mustered all the strength she could, pushed the shovel up and turned, levering Rufus off of her. He swung around to try and jump upon her again, but Lisa moved quickly and struck him on the jaw with the iron scoop of the shovel. The feral dog whimpered and stumbled, giving Lisa just enough time to stand. She didn't waste a moment, didn't think of the years she had shared with him, and the adventures they had braved together. She didn't think of the knights curled up on the bed next to one another. She couldn't. If she did, she might not have the strength to do what needed to be done. She simply brought the shovel back down on his head, over and over, endlessly as if whatever had infected him wouldn't let one be enough, and it kept trying to make him get back up and seize her. Whatever this horrid creature had given to him, it wouldn't let it be easy for either of them. As the last blows fell, Lisa broke down in tears, the sound of her sobs filling the hot night air. Her strength sapped. She collapsed in a heap next to her beloved, and now still, dog. She cried until she was empty, and her blurry, tear-streaked vision gave way to the sight of a million brilliant stars overhead. She had no idea how much time had passed, and she didn't care so long as she didn't have to deal with what she had done to her best, her only friend in the world. Eventually, 
she did look, and was so overcome with sadness at her grim handiwork that she resolved to bury him, to put him to rest the way he deserved. It wasn't his fault, after all. Whatever he had done, he had done because of that evil thing in her cellar. She stood, grabbed the shovel, which was still slick with blood, and proceeded to dig. It took a long time. Lisa made sure it did. But eventually, it was done. In a strange way, it had helped her. She was too exhausted to feel anything. Even fear. And the heat had made her sweat out any lingering trace of emotion. She had been hollowed out. A resolute calm washed over her. She was going to kill that thing in her house. The lights flickered as she stepped back inside, but all else was quiet. Leaving the front door open should she need to make a quick getaway, or if the creature should wish to find a way to leave, she stepped over the debris of her fight with the dog and marched towards the kitchen. She was suddenly stopped by two words that turned her blood into a frozen river. Here, Foxy. Lisa's breathing quickened. There was no other sound beyond the cellar door but for those horrible words. Her words played back in a horrible disfigurement of her voice. She stopped dead in her tracks, and tears of terror formed in her eyes. After a moment in this state, it spoke again. Rufus, stay. Her stomach tied itself into a knot and flipped over. Hearing these words frightened her more than the thought of laying eyes upon its terrible appearance once more. Slowly, she continued on her way into the kitchen, picked up the torch from the floor where Rufus had licked up the blood, and grabbed the largest blade from the knife block. Why did you do that? Lisa jumped, afraid that the creature must have seen her, but the door was still fastened shut. Eventually, she remembered that she had said those words to Rufus after she'd realized what he'd done. The creature was mimicking her, and this time, its voice sounded much closer to her own. Lisa's hand moved to the cellar door's handle, and she fought down a wave of nausea. She took a second to compose herself, then unlatched the bolt and stepped down into the darkness. She didn't have to search for the creature. It made no effort to hide. It stood with its back to her, just a little way beyond the bottom of the steps. The first thing that struck her was how much bigger it now seemed. It stood straight and tall, and the hunched back that led straight into a nub of a head was now the picture of perfect posture, with slender, muscular shoulders, a long neck, and a discernibly more human-looking head, complete with hair. Aside from a few spaces here and there, there was now skin covering it. Familiar skin replacing the monstrosity of exposed muscle that had been there before. 
Here, Foxy, it said. Lisa's curiosity got the better of her. She reached the bottom of the steps, outstretched a hand to touch the creature's shoulder, and gently turned it. The facial features were not yet complete. There were still some distorted patches, or elements that had not fully come together. But Lisa knew that they would. She knew exactly how they would look, and even how they would feel under her fingers. Its brown eyes looked quizzically into her own, as if it wasn't ready to start thinking yet. Lisa understood. As she stared at it, the distorted features started to come into focus more rapidly, no longer having to rely on a fleeting memory of how Lisa had looked. Now it could see every detail, and could replicate it effortlessly. Within minutes, Lisa was looking at a perfect copy of herself. The thing so monstrous, even its blood could make the purest things turn toxic and die, was wearing her skin. A new shell for the horror within. She touched it once again to see if it even felt the same. It did. Lisa started to laugh. The sound echoed off of the lonely walls of the basement. Her own face looked back at her and cocked its head. In the gloom of that cellar, she looked at herself. Evil twin, she said. In the timber frame house, in the middle of nowhere, just before dawn, on a night that was hotter than hell. A woman stepped through a hallway, littered with broken things. She looked out of her open front door. Clouds were gathering overhead. The storm will come today. The heat will break. She swung the door closed. This story was written and read by Andrew Bate, with music also by Andrew Bate. Penny Dreadfuls from the Moth Sanctuary is an audiobook series by Moth Sanctuary Productions. You can subscribe to the series on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, and YouTube. Follow Moth Sanctuary Productions on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or for more dark delights, visit mothsanctuaryproductions.com. <laughs>